Hi everyone, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagnon with the Forest Landowner Education Program and today I am joining you from Struble's Creek on the Virginia Tech campus in Blacksburg, Virginia. Our topic today is going to be about water quality and this ties in really nicely with forestry. When we do any kind of forest management activity and in particular a timber harvest, one of our main concerns is not letting those activities affect water quality. And so to talk more about this today, I have my friend and colleague, Dr. Sally Entrickin with us, and I'm gonna hand the microphone over to her, let her introduce herself, and then she's gonna teach you about different ways to measure water quality. Hi, thanks Jen for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm Sally Entrickin, I'm an aquatic entomologist at Virginia Tech, and I study how the aquatic organisms, mostly animal invertebrates or insects, reflect the water quality in streams, rivers, and wetlands. Um, so when we talk about water quality, we're talking about lots of different things that typically are running off of the landscape. So obviously, um, forestry practices have a big impact on the, the stream and river water quality, particularly in terms of sedimentation, but also um, in the amount of uh, debris that flows off, like Jen already mentioned, and even sometimes the salts, and salts that come off of the roads that are built for um, forestry management. And so obviously we can see sedimentation. It's, a, it's probably the number one impairment of uh, streams and rivers in the country. And we can also see that it has an effect on the aquatic macroinvertebrates. So when I talk about macroinvertebrates, uh, what I'm talking about are aquatic insects, and their relatives like snails and crayfish and mussels that live at the bottom of a stream, a lake, or a river. And because they hang out, they're pretty sedentary, they have to be exposed to all the environmental changes that happen in the waterway. So that could mean, for example, sedimentation over the course of their lifetime. Now because they live usually um, one year or even longer in some cases like mussels that can live up to over a hundred years old, they're reflecting this environmental change over a very long period of time. And so we can assess, uh, just look at the water or take water quality samples to run for dissolved oxygen or sediment directly. That's giving us a snapshot of what's happening in the water at any given time. And it's a product of the watershed or the surrounding landscape. The benefit of using aquatic organisms, whether it's macroinvertebrates, um, it could be algae, it could be fishes, is that they live there over the span of their lifetime and so they're uh, the species identity, so who's there, what they're doing in the watershed or in the water, um, and their overall uh, density or their abundance will tell us uh, the history of the, of the watershed, the history of the landscape. So um, using macroinvertebrates in particular is, is common for biological assessment or bioassessment. The Environmental Protection Agency, for example, has standardized methods that are used um, to identify if there has been impaired aquatic life. So there's a very specific definition of what impaired aquatic life means. And we are able to go out and collect the samples, collect the macroinvertebrates, for example, off of rocks. This is a, um, was a small case of a macroinvertebrate. We'll, we'll collect using standardized methods that are described by the protocols by the states or by the Environmental Protection Agency. And then we'll use their uh, metrics that are really just the composition of the macroinvertebrates and their uh, relative abundances to tell us if, is the water quality or has it been over the span of these organisms' lifetime, has it been um, preserved as excellent? Is it pretty good? Is it, or is it fair, or is it impaired? And so there's, um, there's a lot of uh, information on aquatic macroinvertebrates, both their identity and what they do in the stream, if they eat uh, sediment or algae, if they eat leaf litter, if they're uh, tolerant to uh, changes in the environmental conditions. For example, are they tolerant to sedimentation? Some aquatic uh, macroinvertebrates are. So if you have a lot of those relative to other things, that's a big warning sign that there's been a history of sedimentation in this particular waterway. 
In contrast, a lot of aquatic invertebrates have external gills for getting oxygen, and they're very sensitive to changes in dissolved oxygen. So if you have a decline in dissolved oxygen that often occurs with um, too much sedimentation, too many nutrients coming off as fertilizers from agricultural sites, uh, these organisms will disappear or become very rare in a waterway. So we have the capability to pretty quickly just take, we call them benthic or bottom of the waterway samples and look at the relative abundance of uh, tolerant taxa versus sensitive taxa to tell if we've got uh, high quality or low quality uh, water. So urban streams suffer from what's called the urban stream syndrome by having this very flashy hydrology that creates uh, extreme environmental conditions for aquatic organisms where a lot of times fish can't even live or only the most tolerant and that's the same with the uh, macroinvertebrates. Now we're downstream from this urban, uh, this urban stream, Struble's Creek, and we're moving into a more forested area and so you see here that we do have some riparian cover and this riparian cover, although it's not extensive, it's at least providing uh, some shade for the aquatic organisms. And that goes a long way in just buffering the, uh, at least the temperature extremes that these organisms are experiencing. It doesn't, however, um, fix the problem with the flashy uh, stream flows. But we've also got um, a substrate here. We look at the substrate a lot when we try to understand the macroinvertebrate diversity and their functions because they live on the bottom of the stream. So we can predict that if we have a lot of cobbles like here and boulders, this is a pretty stable substrate. So we could potentially have um, aquatic macroinvertebrates that are relatively long lived. They could, they could hang out here and live for the duration of their lifespan. In contrast, we see some gravel and um, fine sands that deposit along the edges that's where the, the more tolerant organisms live, like chironomids, that uh, can complete their life cycle, sometimes in as little as a week. So they are often associated with more impaired water quality conditions. Uh, to identify impaired aquatic life, the first thing we have to decide is what, we're, what habitats we're gonna sample. We wanna sample them all, because macroinvertebrates are very specifically adapted to the different, my, we call it microhabitats, local scaled habitats. And the more diversity, the more likely you are going to uh, score as uh, excellent water quality. However, if you have something like sedimentation or some type of chemical contamination, you can have poor water quality despite having a diversity of different habitat types in your stream reach. And so what we'll do is um, we take qualitative samples, so we just sample as much habitat as possible as a way to uh, characterize the, all the diversity in the stream. And now this is a, you know, I told you an urban stream, you see evidence of sedimentation on this rock. So we do have some, um, it looks like some moss and it's capturing some fine sediments. The moss is an excellent habitat for macroinvertebrates, but what we can see here is typically if you pick up a rock this size, you're going to have mayflies this time of year and some caddisflies and coronamid midges, and we see nothing. So this is, this is already telling me that there's a water quality problem here. And one of the solutions to that impairment was the, the, um, the university supporting the restoration downstream of Struble's Creek, where they've replanted uh, trees, they've provided greater um, sinuosity or bending in the stream and uh, increased habitat heterogeneity by adding different types of substrates like more large rocks, large woody debris, so that you've got a, a greater diversity of habitat types and they're monitoring how this is changing the overall function of the stream with some uh, real-time remotely sensed uh, sensors like uh, the, the stream flow, water temperature, uh, and things like that. So they're definitely working downstream, but we're still upstream of where they've restored. And what we see a lot of here are <laughs> corbicula shells. Everybody's going to see the Asian clam shells in their creeks, their local creeks. These are, have been introduced 
Um, these aren't alive, but you'll see these shells. And they, they are not um, you know, indicators of good water quality. They do serve an important function of, as filter feeders. But, uh, but what we'd rather see would be uh, native mussel species or some mayflies and, and some stoneflies. And when I look, I do see that this is a caddisfly. This is a uh, net spinning caddisfly case. So you can imagine that if you pick up a rock like this, there's no reason why these shells and rocks could, should be stuck. Do you see how they're stuck? It's because this caddisfly has silk um, netting and it spins these materials together as a very pretty <laughs> well armored retreat. So they live under this, this retreat and then they have a net that's very fine and it filters fine particulates from the water. So they're functioning to take fine particles out of the water column. This, this um, silk can be so strong and you can have so many of these caddisflies that they can stabilize an entire you know, 50 meters of a stream bed. And they've, they're considered ecosystem engineers because they're tiny and you may not have a large biomass but their activity in the stream is so great and it has such a large impact on other aquatic organisms by stabilizing the, the bed that they can change the entire food web of a stream or river. Here's the actual caddisfly. It's not real happy being poked and prodded. But you can see the head and the abdomen can you see that? So they are able to produce silk. They're related to, closely related to Lepidopterans, the um, moths and butterflies. Caddisfly, they're called hy they're hydrocycidae, case-making caddisflies that are uh, net-spinning caddisflies. They're, when we, when we um, look at their tolerance value, their tolerance to changes in dissolved oxygen and sediment, they're, they're relatively tolerant. So it's not super degraded, but it's also not because we're not finding any other mayflies um, or even some of their other caddisfly relatives. This is, this is probably going to get a, a, a fair to okay rating if you were to do a biological assessment. So we've been looking at some ca uh, net spinning caddisflies, the hydrocycid caddisflies. Here are their, their nets. You can see they really take advantage of having some algae and um, moss on these rocks and then all those little holes are made by their retreat. So when we go to sample, the first thing we want to do is always start come into the stream down at the very uh, the most downstream end so you don't disrupt the organisms that are upstream. They're very sensitive to changes in the water velocity as you can imagine. They think you're a fish coming to get them. So you come up from the downstream, you walk up from the downstream end You'll take your first sample, and we're sampling here. There's, um, there are riffles. That is where the water's flowing the, the fastest. It's the most shallow. Then you've got a run where the water is, you don't see so much turbulence, and the water's still flowing. And then you have pools where uh, the water is barely moving at all. And in this case, this, these urban streams are notorious for not really having much diversity. It's usually just kind of one big run, uh, and that's, kind of, that's what we're in here, is just kind of one big run. So we want to sample in flowing water because if we don't, whatever we dis dislodge isn't going to make it into our net. So you put your uh, D-frame kick net on the bottom of the stream, also known as the benthos, and you stand above it so that the flow is going into the net, and then you just want to kick material into the net for usually a standardized amount of time. So we try to get all of the material from the net back into the tray. Um, I just use a cam um, film developing tray if everybody knows what that is. Uh, you can still buy them. It's a specialty item I know. But uh, the white pan really works the best because it's contrast with the bugs. Otherwise, it's very difficult to see them. So here's one of those 
uh, net spinning caddis flies, the hydrocycidae. This is huh, this is a riffle beetle here. If you can see it, it's very small. It's really moving. So like, get me out of this tray. But it's an indicator of pretty um, high water quality. They require a lot of oxygen. They live in flowing waters. So that's a good sign. What is this? I think that's another riffle beetle. Again, a good sign that there's uh, plenty of dissolved oxygen. This is a black fly, family Simuleidae. You guys know them as adults, they bite, but they're, they're filter feeders. And they can live in relatively um, high sediment areas, but they're really important for filtering the, the water. So you find them, they're gonna have a you know, they're not indicative of high water quality, but they also play a really important role in <clears throat> clean water and in um, relatively polluted water. One thing I want you to be to remember is that these tolerant taxa, like the black fly, we have some coronum and midges in here. There are some um, amphipods that are crustaceans here. They're going to be found in most uh, streams. They're ubiquitous. So just because you have them doesn't mean the water quality is poor. What indicates poor water quality is that that's all you have. But here we're seeing these caddis flies and these riffle beetles. So I'm quite certain these are riffle beetle larvae. I'm quite certain that these conditions are not um, poor. They're, they're between fair and good. That's how this stream would likely rank. And, and that's not too bad for an urban stream in July, where you would expect uh, there to be pretty warm water, low dissolved oxygen, and uh, we know that there's some sedimentation just looking at the bottom of the stream. Well, thanks for spending 15 minutes in the creek with us, and thanks to Sally for spending time with us outside to share her knowledge about water quality. Um, I hope you join us next Friday at noon for another edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest. Have a great weekend.